Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP, Ukraine War News Update, second part thereof, the 30th of March 2024. Let's get to the military aid and equipment uh, section. I don't think I'm going to do the geopolitics again in this video today. There's so much going on, so I'll separate that. So we'll start with Shmihal, the, the Ukrainian Prime Minister, Denis Shmihal saying that Ukraine ha is to receive a record budget financing from allies in March. On the one hand, that's great. It shows how much support they are getting to help function. On the other hand, it's not so good because it shows they need that much support. They are in such desperate straits that they need to be financed to record-breaking levels. So you can interpret that in several ways. Uh, but yeah, they're going to get the largest budget financing from its allies since the start of Ukraine's independence. Um, right, um, in terms of military aid proper, we're going to start with Belgium. It's not often that happens. Belgium has allocated 100 million euros for maintenance of Ukrainian F-16 fighter jets. The Belgian Federal Council of Ministers has approved such assistance today. I wonder whether you'll start getting this momentum gathering inside the EU as we're hearing more and more of Russian interference in European politics. That's a red flag for, for many, possibly, and it might start um, inspiring, motivating some people who previously been sitting on the fence to go, yeah, OK, Russia is a problem. We need to do something more explicitly about it. Uh, the Polish uh, foreign minister said transport of shells under the Czech initiative has already be begun being, well, it's already being organised. Transport of shells for Ukraine secured through the Czech-led initiative is already being organised. And it, there are some claiming it will be, um, some will have arrived or will be on the way by the end of this month. Quote, the fact that the initiative has already received firm pledges of support backed by money and that the transport is already being organised means that we feel a burden of responsibility to help Ukraine fight the Russian invasion, says Sikorsky. On the other hand, uh, this has literally just come out about five minutes ago. Czech-led ar uh, led artillery initiative still lacks funds, according to the Estonian defense minister at the moment we can say that money is lacking more than projectiles now i don't think this will be in terms of pledges for money it's probably more in terms of yeah okay everyone's pledged the the money now we need, need to actually see that money that money needs to go into a bank account uh, that's what we're missing so i i think there's a there's the the political will it just hasn't translated into uh, cash um, right, we're going to spend a little bit of time on ATACMS because, as I mentioned yesterday, US uh, uh, Chairman of US Joint Chiefs of Staff Charles Brown stated that risks of escalation of the war associated with the supply of ATACMS long-range missiles to Ukraine have decreased today compared to what they were before. So this is opening the door to ATACMS being given uh, perhaps en masse to Ukraine. First thing to say is, yeah, you can say what you like about whether it's fine to give aid tackums, but unless you actually get that aid package from the or through Congress in the US and from the US to Ukraine, it's all kind of moot. But assuming that an aid package will come, we can, I think, be fairly justified in thinking it will contain at least some aid tackums. Uh, what has changed? And I talked about this yesterday in terms of getting the prism. The replacement missile seems to be coming online. And so therefore, there won't be a strategic lacking of this kind of missile that the Americans could use in any given uh, theater of war, Iran or elsewhere. I, you can talk about Taiwan, but they're unlikely they'd use that type of missiles in uh, that sort of geographical situation with an island and and boats and uh, ships and whatnot so anyway the idea is that they they wanted to keep a strategic reserve of this kind of missile so they couldn't give the ATACMs without getting the prism in but there's also this idea of red lines in general so an appraisal of the war and things have changed and other other weapons have been given and Russia's done nothing uh, their attacks into Russian territory with drones and missiles and actually we're at a point where 
we are evaluating things, or the Americans would be saying this, we are evaluating things differently now than we would have done a year ago when perhaps we said no to ATACMs. And these kind of two ideas are kicking about. So the generals said that due to Russia's restrained response to a series of recent Ukrainian drone attacks, actually, so uh, let's rewind. Top US general says sending ATACMs to Ukraine is not as risky as before. The risk of escalation related to the supply of long range army tactical missile systems in Ukraine is not as high as it used to be. So this is the escalation thing and not the strategic reserves thing. The general said that due to Russia's restrained response to a series of recent Ukrainian drone attacks on Russian oil refineries, the Pentagon has adjusted its analysis on the risk of sending ATACMs. Uh, and then Mark Hartman says, for those that kept saying, given they attack them, there were reasons for the US did not provide them during the last two years. It's based on the requirements for other US contingencies and limited supplies. So that's going back to not the red line issue, but the strategic uh, stockpiles and contingency plans and all that. Rob Lee here, quoting from the Wall Street Journal, says, but the Pentagon is now open to providing longer range attackers because of progress in acquiring follow-on systems dubbed the Precision Strike Missile Prism. A US official say the, that removes a major impediment to providing the long range variant. Um, yeah. So there, there are these different, different, still these different ideas kicking around. But anyway, whatever. Hopefully, they'll be able to get the Ukrainians will be able to get some of these missiles soon. <sighs> Fingers crossed. Uh, quote: When Russia has missiles and we don't, they attack by missiles. Everything: gas, energy, schools, factories, civilian buildings. Uh, this is what Zelensky has said. Atakum three hundred. So the three hundred kilometer Atakums. That is the answer. He continued. He said he wanted to use the longer range missiles not to attack Russian territory, but those airfields in Crimea. So let's have a little look at this. So Zelensky recalled that in Munich in February, he took out a map of the targets the ATACMs could hit. Quote, I showed them military platforms like airports, air defense systems and other sites, he said. When I asked if the ATACMs are on the way, as is rumored in Washington, he laughed and said, I, quote, I can't share with you this information, sorry. He said that the missiles are not in Ukraine now, a Washington Post said in the interview. Um, so... They need ATACMs, they don't have them, they previously asked for them, and they even showed the Americans where what they would hit, and they still didn't come because of the aforementioned reasons. And this delay, Zelensky, as I mentioned in my previous video, this delay is seeing the, uh, the Ukrainian president become more and more overt and explicit in his criticism of the situation in the Congress, in Congress in the US. So, quote, we lost half a year. We can't waste time anymore. Ukraine can't be a political issue between the parties. If Ukraine falls, Putin will divide the world into Russia's friends and enemies. I mean, you can't put it as more any more succinctly than that. And this is Finally, Ukraine, well, not finally, you can see why it wouldn't have done, and this could be a little bit damaging. So the more, is, is, the problem here is the more Zelensky voices his true feelings about the matter, which is this has become a partisan issue in the US, the more it will entrench certain people in US politics into those positions that they have, that they have, you know, your Marjorie Taylor Greens and your anti-Ukraine uh, politicians into their ensconced um viewpoints but uh so yeah so so it's it's difficult because you want Zelensky to speak his mind to say look this is the problem we have lost half a year please get us a staff but the more he says that the more annoyed some politicians might get in the US he said no USA no choice but to retreat i mean he's really connecting future ukrainian success or failure with the US aid package, uh, saying it's critical for Kyiv's defence against Russia, uh, but it's been obviously stalled since, what, October last year. Um, it, just so frustrating. Right, on to France again. Uh, in Poland, for the past year, several French units have been training about 10 Ukrainian battalions. I think that this is probably a conglomerate of European or allied forces, including sort of, uh, American, possibly, I don't know, about... Australians and Kiwis and whatnot, because I know in the UK uh, there are there's also training taking place. So there's training taking place in in probably 
well, definitely in Poland and the UK and I think Germany as well. And so different nations will be help, helping out in different places. But anyway, the French are helping out in Poland, uh, training 10 Ukrainian battalions. Each Ukrainian battalion is trained for several weeks in trench warfare, forest warfare and urban warfare. The trainees are trained in collective and combined arms manoeuvres at all levels. French training is evolving to meet the needs of Ukrainian forces. That's really good news if that is indeed happening, as according to French aid to Ukraine it is, because there's been these long-running complaints that the training is not fit for purpose, that it's NATO training for NATO sort of engagements. And of course, NATO will fight in very different ways, not just in terms of the kind of training and doctrine they have. I know Ukraine is moving across to NATO doctrine, but NATO wouldn't get involved in, in, in a war without complete air dominance, air superiority, air supremacy. And once you have that, then you your troops do very different things. There isn't trench warfare. You aren't doing this, and they probably aren't training on on massive drone usage. You like you you flatten places with uh, aircraft, and then you move your vehicles and whatnot in, and you do these combined arms maneuvers. In Ukraine, the lines are static. No one's got air su superiority. There's a slight air advantage. Well, there's an air advantage to to Russia, uh, but it's still contested airspace. There are drones everywhere. You're sitting in trenches getting yourself blown to bits by aviation bombs or drones or artillery or mortars. Like That's a different warfare to NATO. And so therefore the NATO training has, has uh, you know, certainly at the beginning of the the uh, the training that they were given was, was not fit for purpose. Infantry battalion training. French soldiers are now accompanying... Uh, initially focused on infantry battalion training, French soldiers are now accompanying their Ukrainian counterparts in combined arms exercises, realistically, to prepare them as well as possible for their mission. Um, so that's good stuff. The French seeming to be uh, becoming more involved. And this is what I talked about previously, but just a little bit more detail about this. France will hand, hand over decommissioned military equipment to Ukraine instead of simply throwing it away. These will mainly be the replace the due to the schedules for replacement in particularly the VABs, these armor personnel carriers. There will be other bits of kit and some AMX uh, 10 RCs, these those light tanks on wheels. Um, and, and other stuff. Since we are reinvesting massively in our armies with this 413 billion euro plan for 2024 to 2030, so it's a six year plan, we have a lot of equipment that is still working and that is going to be taken out of our armies. Rather than scrapping them or giving them to other countries, we're giving them to the Ukrainian army. But I repeat, there's never been any lowering of our defense model, he emphasized. So he's not, you know, don't worry, French people, we're not like offloading loads of our stuff and being left with nothing. This is, this is part of a replacement schedules um now talking i think this is a reflection of the seriousness in the uk this is a uk specific bit here but it might well be um representative of of things happening across the world i don't know let me know if your country struggles with recruitment but in the uk we're struggling with recruitment for the armed forces because you know modern young people like sitting on their consoles and uh, ordering stuff from Amazon. Um, it's essentially like me, but in more youthful form. And the armed forces are struggling to recruit people. Now, one of the things in UK recruitment, my, my dad was in the Navy, right? And he, uh, he was never allowed to grow, you, you're not allowed to grow a beard, but you're allowed to have a beard. Which means that you have to, you basically have to grow a beard when you're on leave. So take take two week two weeks leave, grow a beard, and come back. You got a beard, but you, you're not allowed to grow one. Uh, you have to keep clean shaven. So unless you have that beard. So anyway, with army recruitment being a big priority in recent YouGov finding that most men, fifty four percent of men, now say they currently have a beard or a moustache. I asked the army, says Grant Shapps, the um, Secretary of Defence for the for the government. I asked the army to formally review the outdated beard ban. Today, this sensible change in rules has been made. So the army is now allowing soldiers to grow beards for the first time. There will be rules about this to do with gas masks, I think, and and so on and so forth. But I I, I would think there'll be um, reasons 
you know why that's that's now permissible that there would be different types of gas masks i don't know um the reason men aren't joining has nothing to do with uh, an attachment to facial hair it's because the globalists uh scum despise us ruin our culture facilitate facilitate invaders and have a penchant for wars in conflicts that do not concern us says dan on twitter but the there is a point there actually that will that really affect recruitment? What what the government are trying to do is make it as easy as possible. But you don't want to put barriers up to recruitment. Um, and, and I think that's just an easy win, although you'd think it's an easy win. But as Shashank Joshi, the defence correspondent for The Economist, says, delighted to see the UK defence debates hone in on key issues here. So this is Richard Kemp saying, it's disgraceful to allow soldiers to grow beards. Really? Allowing beards won't fix army staffing problems, says Ben Wallace, the former Secretary of Defence. Uh, well, uh, maybe, maybe it won't fix it. But again, it's just like, just sort out the little things. Yep, we can easily change that, easily change that. We just need more people to join the armed forces. Because, do you know what? Stuff is happening around the world. Anyway, the point being that this is reflective of a larger worry, I think, in certain corridors of power that we are simply not militarily prepared. We need more people in the armed forces. We're, in the UK, there's been this worry that we've had two assault ships just mothballed uh, for no other reason that we don't have the people to fill them. Um, and so recruitment is an issue. And when you're talking about what's going on with Russia and what's going on um, in Eastern Europe, are the British prepared? You know, the French are talking about, talking much more in military terms at the moment. The Polish have been ramping up massively. Uh, there's there's talk about conscription changes in some of the Nordic states and Scandin uh, Scandinavian, the Baltic states, so on and so forth. Like there are lots of countries that are gearing up to to be to, to be more militarily prepared. Is is the UK there? Are other countries there? Is your country there? Let me know what you think. Uh, Russia and Korea are ready to launch, that's North Korea, direct charter flights between the countries, the head of the Russian Ministry of Nature, uh, Kozlov, has said. Now, this might seem, yeah, like, so what? But I try and join the dots here. There's been this these rumours that North Korea are ready to provide some troops for Russia. Uh, is this a way of smuggling troops into Russia from North Korea? Is this a way to help Russia, uh, I'd say crypto mobilize, but I, you could also say it's not quite klepto -mo mobilize. They're not stealing them so much as, as exchanging them for uh, probably for just raw materials and, uh, and money or something. But anyway, uh, those dots might be joinable. I'm not sure. Now, Russia has modernised the X-101 air-launched cruise missile, which has received an increased warhead from 450 kilograms to around 800, according to Defence Express. This is really significant. So a cruise missile becoming almost double as potent. If such missiles are launched from the Saratov region, even at targets in the Lviv region, such a X-101 will still have 500 to 700 kilometres left for additional manoeuvres. Uh, yeah, that is that is definitely a worry there anyway uh, that's enough for me from the military aid and equipment segment slightly shorter but i'll go on and do the geopolitical video for you take care speak soon